Morning, everyone. I'm reading Mark 1, 14 to 20. And it's on 1002 of the Church Bible. The calling of the first disciples. After John had put, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their net. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bob. Let's just pray for Dean now and for ourselves as we open ourselves to hear God's word. Father, we thank you for Dean, Lord, for the work that he's put in in preparing for this talk this morning. Lord, I just pray for your anointing on him, that the words he speaks, Lord, would have the power to uh, transform our hearts and minds. Pray for each one of us, Lord, that we would be open to hear your voice and obedient to it. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Right. Okay, there are three questions I seek to answer during this sermon. Um, the first one is, what is the kingdom of God and why is it good news? Second one, why did the disciples respond to Jesus' Jesus's calling and, and promptly? And, and what's this got to do with us anyway here at Christ Church in, what are we, 2018? Okay, let's start with number one. So what is meant by the kingdom of God? Although in Matthew, he will talk about kingdom of heaven. They are the same thing. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew's gospel was very much targeted at the Jews. And they kind of wanted to use the name God with reverence. So we didn't tend to use that word very often. So why is it good news? So let's just let's quickly look back at uh, Mark 1.14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent, believe the good news. How does that grab you here this morning, on a sunny morning? Let's have a look at that word or phrase, kingdom of God, and why it's such good news. What does the word kingdom mean? Well, kingdom means rule. And if we make reference to Psalm 103, it reads, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. And his kingdom rules over all. So that's 103 verse 19. You can hear the basic meaning of the word kingdom in this psalm as rule. Kingly rule. His reign. His action. His lordship. And his sovereign governance. So since God's purpose for the world, our world, his creation is to save a people for himself and to renew the world for that people, his kingly rule implies a saving and a redeeming activity on their behalf. We have a God who's in the business of saving and redeeming. That's the role of Jesus. He redeemed us. He took our place. He paid the price. 
God the King is coming in a way, in a new way, into the world to establish his saving rule. And he did that by triumphing over sin and death. And that's what the kingdom of God is all about. Triumphing over sin and death. So the coming of Christ, the king, brings the kingdom to his people, you and I. King Jesus does that. The kingdom of God is God, King Jesus, stepping down and reigning, ruling, and ultimately in your, you and my lives. So why is this such good news, this kingdom of God? Jesus says it's good news. Why is it? Well, the first reason is this. We've got an element of that, really, a Remembrance Sunday, really. Normally, when earthly kings want to establish their kingdoms, it normally means shedding blood of a people's. And on Remembrance Sunday, we kind of remember that other people trying to establish their kingdoms in Europe, predominantly, um, and it cost other people's blood. Not so with King Jesus. He establishes his kingdom for the shedding of his own blood on the cross. That's the first reason. There is a price of blood in the coming of this new kingdom, this kingdom of God. And King Jesus paid it with his own blood. The second reason why the coming of God's kingdom is good news can be heard through Luke 4, verse 18. And again, it picks up from Isaiah 61. Let's have, a lis- let's have a listen to what Jesus said after he returns from the wilderness, after his baptism and temptation by Satan. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And this is what the coming of the kingdom of God looks like. When Jesus read this scripture out in the synagogue in Nazareth, at the beginning of his earthly ministry, he was basically saying, that he had come to bring freedom. Freedom from death and sin and all that binds and places us in captivity. This scripture speaks of Jesus, the Messiah's ministry of preaching and healing that, would, that will meet every human need. The kingdom of God is the good news and Jesus is the person who brings it into the here and now, today. So let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look at a small part of this uh, this scripture. Preach good news to the poor. Why is the kingdom of God good news to the poor? Jesus here is talking about spiritual, the, the spiritual poor. In his Sermon on the Mount, he goes on to say, "Blessed." are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew three. Sorry, Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So who are these spiritually poor? They are people who are feeling helpless, hopeless, in despair, unworthy, and broken. I think we may be feeling some of those and sharing some of those characteristics here a little bit at Christ Church at the moment. Jesus says to us, who are poor in spirit, congratulations. That's what blessed means. You are blessed. If you're poor in spirit, you are blessed. How does that feel? When you're poor in spirit, do you feel blessed? Congratulations? That's not the first word that comes to my mind, and probably no one in this room either. 
Jesus says to us who are poor in spirit, congratulations, you are best. We might not at first recognize it, but it's not really about us. It's about how God sees it. Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. There is hope for us if we feel worthless and depleted in confidence because God is working on our case and because the kingdom of God belongs to us. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Does that sound like good news? There is hope for us if we feel worthless and depleted in confidence because God is working in our case. That is why he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. I just wonder, and you can come back to me on this if you, if you want to talk about it. I just wonder whether we are, in, we are in a much more spiritually healthy place with God now than we have been for a long time at Christ Church because we are spiritually poor. We may not be financially or even in a physically good place all the time now at church, but we are becoming a much more God-focused church because of it. And that is where the blessing lies. God, our Heavenly Father, is saying to us through this scripture today, that he, that he is here for us. He's saying, I'm your hope. Trust in me. I'm with you. Come, walk with me. Come into the river with me and swim with me. Now, it's interesting. Yesterday, I, took, I didn't go to men's breakfast. I needed a bit of space. And... Um, so I went off to um, around High Wycombe. It's, it's amazing how you have to go far away sometimes to kind of meet with God, isn't it? We don't have to do that, but it's interesting how sometimes that helps. It's a lovely parkland. I went to, um, I can't it's called now, Hewenden. Uh, it's a lovely parkland there. And, um, and sometimes it's just really nice just walking with the Lord. <laughs> And they have, I'm not particularly very into my birds, but they had loads of like eagles, hawks, I don't know what you call them. They've got a, they are, they're about normal birds. And they had loads of them. And, I'm, and one of my friends, who, you know, I went by myself, always said, oh, you know, God's in these things. And um, he's saying, there's the Lord in that. So I was kind of praying, what, what does this mean? Fortunately, Google was working there. And, um, and so I was able to type in, you know, where about uh, scriptures about, Eagles and Isaiah 40 came to mind or came up. I'd strongly recommend you to read Isaiah 40. It's quite a long, I don't do it now, uh, do, it for, <laughs> do it for a bit of homework. It is an incredible piece of scripture because, in a way, it puts us in our place. I'm not going to give too much about it away, but have a read of it. That scripture really spoke to me, and I'm sharing it with you because it might mean something to us here at Christ Church. I'm just going to read a little bit out. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. In essence, we're saying that God doesn't know anything about us. He's kind of left us. My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. In a way, this is what the Lord is saying. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of, creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. 
Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, but those who hope in the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. In a way, that is about the kingdom of God. And it's about being poor in spirit. We have a God who is for us. When we have reached rock bottom, when it appears that there is no hope, you're poor in spirit. And we are blessed because at that point, we often turn to God. And God is saying, you are blessed. Congratulations. When it appears there is no hope, and the only hope we have is in the Lord, and he is faithful. Have a test of that. Come back to me. And um, I, I say, please have a look at Isaiah 40. It is absolutely, truly amazing. And, and we are his creation. But we're not like rocks and trees. God created those. We are more than that. We are the sheep of his pasture, and he knows us each by name. That's good news. And that's what the kingdom of God is all about. Part two. Why did the disciples respond to Jesus' calling? The calling of the first disciples has often perplexed me. It's a great word, that is, isn't it? It has often made me feel quite guilty at my own response or lack of response of Jesus in my own life. Let's have a look at, again, Mark 1, 16 to 19. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, said Jesus, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When they had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Come, follow me. And they did at once. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father in the boat with the hired men and followed him. What do you make of that? We've heard that hundreds of times probably in the church. What do you really think of that? If you look at the following encounter we just read out, in the other Gospels, and there's references here in Matthew, Luke, and John, there's a little more to the encounter than is described in Mark. But nevertheless, there isn't much dilly-dallying taking place in any of these Gospel accounts. So why did they drop pretty much everything and follow Jesus so promptly? Now, originally, I used to think that it was something about Jesus' physical presence, is what I used to think, that stopped them in, in their tracks. And drew them to him. Perhaps he had hypnotic eyes and he was a good looking chap. So they stopped to think, yep, I'll follow you. However, spending time reading, there's a great book, Artie Kendall, Why Jesus Died, and some meditation on Isaiah 53. And having spent some time on that, I've come to believe that I've come to believe that Jesus was nothing like the physical portrayal that I originally thought. Have a listen to this piece of scripture, and it's Isaiah 53, verses 2 to 3. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, 
nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A root out of dry ground, that's attractive, isn't it? He had no beauty or majesty to to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we would desire him. This scripture would seem to suggest that Jesus was an ordinary-looking bloke of his time. And I think it was that it's what Jesus said that made the difference. And the scripture repeatedly confirms this, that when Jesus spoke, he spoke as one with authority. And there's loads of encounters like this in the New Testament. This is uh, Matthew seven twenty-eight. The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one with authority and not as their teachers of the law. So why did the disciples and the many other people who followed Jesus respond to him like they did? I think these disciples must have been spiritually hungry. I think they may have been fed up and not satisfied with their spiritual life. And they wanted more than the religion and legalism that was on offer by their established religious authority. They knew that there must be more to life than this. They had a lot of religion in that time. Lots and lots of rules. And I don't think it touched the sides with them. I think they did their best. But it wasn't working. It wasn't satisfying. And I think that's why it's good news. When Jesus comes to bring freedom. Do you think there is more to life than this? In our own lives. How do you feel spiritually now? Are you satisfied? Or do you believe that there is more on offer? Than we are currently experiencing. Last week we saw a church respond to God's invitation to get into the water, to get into the water with him. And that was amazing. That was the biggest altar call I have seen at Christ Church during my eight years here. Last week's sermon by Andy, I think his name's Glidden, Glyden, from St. Hugh's, was great. It was amazing. God was very merciful and generous with us with that powerful message. It was a message of hope, a message that isn't all, sorry, it was a message of hope, a message that this isn't all that's available to us individually or as a church. He's saying there's more. That's what last week was about. But don't stop there. This is a real message I want us to kind of really think about individually and as Christ Church. Last week, we got into the water. We went up, responded to the Holy Spirit, to God. And we received prayer, every single one of us. Let's not stop there. We might have walked into the water a little bit last week. Let's not jump back out. Please, I say this to myself as well, let's not jump back out of that water. Keep going. Don't stop there. Keep walking. God is with us, Christ Church. That was an amazing, generous thing that God did with us last week. It was incredible. Praise the Lord. I've just finished reading a book. It's by uh, Mike Bickle, and it's called Passion for Jesus. You won't be surprised what's going to come next. And he refers to the book of Song of Songs. (laughs) I haven't actually mentioned that book for quite a long time. Okay, Um, I think I've been having a fast. Right, um, (laughs) so... (laughs) 
Specifically, he identifies the maiden in the book Song of Songs as a young, maturing church, the bride of Christ. The bride is asleep and is comfortable at home, and Jesus is calling out to her. He's calling out to you and I as well. Come with me. Arise, come, my darling Christ church, my beautiful one. Come with me. Roughly speaking, that's in Song of Songs 2.13. Aren't we that young, maturing church? We're not an old church. This is a young church. What are we, 25? Ish. <laughs> is it funny how people with age always say that, ish? <laughs> we're about 25. We're, a, we're that young, maturing church. Well, if you and I as an individually adopted children of God, have been a little bit comfortable, as it were. Do you know, I love a comfortable life. I have to repent of this every day, okay? Um, I'm not sure God wants us to live comfortable lives, even if I crave it. I think we have to look outside to know why it's not always about our comfort. This is a message to myself more than probably you guys. What if we have individually forgotten our first love and settled for much less than is on offer from Jesus? Have we grown bored with Jesus like the original disciples got bored with the religion of their time? I think that Christ Church is saying that we want more of Jesus. We want more of Jesus in our church and in our own lives. That's what I hope last week was all about. I pray and I hope. Because that was a bold step, actually. That was a good, bold step we did last week. I'm hoping, let's pray for that, we want more. Jesus wants intimacy with his followers. He wanted that with his original disciples too. He spent time with them. He loved them deeply. He taught them things of the kingdom. He equipped them for service. He equipped them to set others free. And he wants intimacy with us also. Now, I haven't actually seen this film, but my students have, and they keep on talking about it. And it's called Evan Almighty. I think that's what it's called, isn't it? Yep, and it's about Noah's Ark. Okay, right. I need to kind of, and I have to watch this with mom and dad at Christmas. Um, apparently, there's a bit in this film, and that Evan, this is before he's built the ark, I think, and and God is sitting on a trunk, a bit of gopher wood, and I think, according to my students, they say Evan goes, Evan goes up to them. He says, I, I think he says, Do I know you? Well, you probably know what God says next. Not as much as I would like you to. And I just wonder, I think God has been saying that to me. I don't know, is he saying that to you guys? What if God is calling you personally to know him more than you currently do? What if Jesus is calling you to grow in a closer relationship with him? than you currently have. How are you going to respond to him? Are you going to be like the young bride in Song of Songs who didn't answer the door to his knocking? And when she did, he was no longer there and she had to go out and look for him. The good news is Jesus can always be found. He wants to be found by you and by me. How do we grow in intimacy with Jesus? You know this. I'm just going to read out a couple of things. Start slowly. It is not a race. Set aside some time each day to spend with Jesus. Start with 10 minutes. And then see what happens. In prayer, ask for Jesus' help in getting to know him more. If he wants a relationship with you, he's going to help you to do that. He's not going to say, he's not going to run away. He's not going to make it hard for us. 
He wants that. Ask him. Spend some time in your Bible. Start with one of the Gospels and read a small section. Don't eat too much to begin with. It's much better to have little small targets and then think, I want to read an hour. No, you won't read an hour. Be practical, be realistic, read a small section and then ask for his help in understanding it. And then if you say, if you want my notes, give thanks for what he has told you about himself in the passage. Speak to him about anything that has been raised in there that touches you. Talk to him about anything. Talk to him about what's going on in your life. He wants to know about those things that are on your heart. It takes a little bit of effort. Most of you are married. That took effort, I think. And I, mean, I know some of you start sooner than later, and sometimes you know put a bit more in. I don't know. Um, you can start slow or quick. Start slowly. See what happens with our Lord. In conclusion, so what is the kingdom of God? It is a kingdom that is ruled by God, by God's appointed Messiah, who is the redeemer of his people and our king. This isn't a future event, but it's in the here and now today. What is it like? It is a kingdom of life and freedom, freedom from sin and death. It is a kingdom that is already breaking into the world and breaking into our own lives if we want it. It is everywhere, it is any time, or any person over whom Jesus is Lord. Jesus is a king who wants to reign in our hearts and minds. And it's for all those who are broken, depleted in confidence, and feel hopeless. And that is why it's such good news. Jesus says to us all at Christ Church, come, follow me. What is our response going to be? Well, I'm going to, it's always kind of a difficult bit, this. Uh, I'm just going to just invite, you can sit down if you wish or stand up. I'm not going to kind of force anything, but sometimes it's really good just to allow God in and to give him space. I have no magic power or anything like that. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit to do what he wants. And sometimes in life, you just give him space. And you can give him space at home. You don't need to be able to do that here. And you just invite him in. And you just say, look, come. What do you want to do? So if you'd like to do that standing up or sitting down, I'm just going to invite you to do so. And let's just spend some time sort of just waiting and receiving the Holy Spirit. So if you want to do that, why don't you just put your hands out in front of you? Okay, because in a way it's kind of saying you're, you're welcoming. And it's about kind of intention as well. Okay, so just put your hands out. And in a way, I'd like you just to, you know, in your mind, in your heart, to, and I'll pray in a minute, but just to invite him here and say, look, you know, you're welcome here. Ask him for his help. Just receive and, yeah, let's just see where it goes. So, Father God, we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and meet with us now. Come, Holy Spirit.
maybe that you just ask the Lord to help you to want him more or to help you walk with him. You can tell him you're nervous. You can tell him, Lord, oh, I don't know where this is going. Be truthful. Just invite him in and ask for his help. Come, Holy Spirit. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Father, you know us individually and as a church. I pray, Father, that you, your spirit, you would fill us with your spirit, Father. Help us to walk with you, Lord. Pray, Lord, that you create within us a hunger and a thirst for your name. Help us to know you more. To receive that good news. to experience the breaking through of your kingdom in our own lives and in this church and parish at Bushmead. We pray for your kingdom come. Lord, we are the sheep of your pasture. We need you to be our shepherd. Help us, Lord. Gather us up. Teach us your ways. Help us to learn from you. We pray and give thanks that you are always with us, that you walk with us through all things. Father, we just praise and give you thanks. Amen. If anyone would like to receive prayer at the end of the service, please don't rush off. I'm happy to, to pray with you. If you want to receive more of the Lord, come on up. We'll see you at the end of the service. Amen. Thank you, Dean. There's really something to think about there. And as we were having that time of silence there, I was just mulling things over. And just thinking about friendships, because our relationship with God is, is that. It's a relationship. And I was thinking about friends, and we all live, bi live busy lives. And if you don't contact your friends, you don't see them. If you don't ring them and see how they're doing or arrange to meet up, it can be weeks and weeks and weeks. And I was sort of convicted a bit there as we were sitting that actually 
We do that with Jesus as well, or I do that with Jesus, and actually it's laziness. And I was convicted that actually it's lazy, you know, I can't be bothered, and that sounds terrible, and I do read my Bible and stuff, but actually there's a laziness there. And if that's you, then perhaps like me, you need to say sorry to God for that and ask him to help you to, you know, not be lazy, because if we don't contact our friends, those relationships die. And that's the same with God. If we don't contact him, if we don't put the effort in to make that relationship work, then that will die. Um, even though God is after our, us and on our case all the time. We're going to finish now the time of worship. That will be um, our offering. And then we'll have a closing prayer.